rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a To the old rugged cross I will ever be true Its shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory forever So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Let's pray together. And as we pray this morning, I'd like for you to remember Sam White in your prayer. Sam has had a few more difficulties uh, with the uh, transplant. And uh, they've got everything under control. But he's back in St. Louis at Siteman Center. So let's remember him and remember his family in our prayers to this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for the cross upon which Jesus died and shed his blood so that we might have eternal life. We are grateful, Father, for the salvation that is ours through our faith in what Jesus has done. We're thankful, Father, knowing that you show us mercy and kindness and grace. And Father, we're grateful that you have included us as part of your purpose and part of your plan for redeeming humanity unto yourself. We're grateful, Lord, that you've called Walnut Street Baptist Church to be a part of this great, great endeavor. And we pray, Father, that we would stand up and that we would be able to go forward and that, Father, we would follow your leadership and your direction and that we would be the church and we would be the people that you have called us to be. Father, this morning we are in prayer for those who are in need, for those who are hurting, For those who are suffering, Father, for those who are in need of vision and purpose and encouragement, we pray, Father, this morning for Sam. And Father, we know that you brought him this far and that you will bring him all the way. So, Father, as he has these setbacks, we pray, Lord, that you would be a source of comfort and strength to him. We thank you, Lord, for his testimony of your work in his life. We pray for Pam. 
We pray for their children. We pray, Lord, that you would be a source of healing in Sam's life. We pray now, Lord, as we continue to worship you today, that you will receive and accept our worship. As we open your word today, we pray, Lord, that you would give us open minds and open hearts that we might respond to you as we should. In Jesus' name, amen. I need to admit to you that I have really struggled this past week in preparing for uh, my Bible study group and also as I uh, prepared this week for the morning message. I had made a commitment at the beginning of the Sunday school year that I was going to, for, the, for as best as I could, that I was going to follow the Sunday morning message, have it follow the theme of our Sunday school time, and to make that kind of a connection because I think it drives home and it helps us to understand better whatever the topic is about. But I have to confess that it would have been very easy for me this week to have uh, preached on, on something else. But this week's topic in our Bible study group had to do with the question, what about those who have never heard of Jesus? What about those who have never heard of Jesus? That's a pretty heavy topic to discuss in 45 minutes in a Bible study group and also in about 25 minutes in a sermon. A lot there to play with, a lot there to consider as we look to the scripture. So what I want to do this morning is that I want to share with you, this is my outline for today, I want to share with you those things that I am sure of, and then I want to share with you my biblical understanding. And then the third point of my message this morning, I would would like to share with you what we need to be concerned about today. So this is what I know for sure. This is the first point. This is what I know for sure. I know for sure that God judges all human beings fairly. We see that in Scripture. We look in in Genesis chapter 18, and uh, the Lord, the angels, and the Lord have come to Abraham And they've told Abraham that they're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham prays to the Lord because his nephew Lot lives in Sodom. And he prays to the Lord. He says, will you destroy the cities if there are 50 righteous people there? And the Lord says, no, I won't destroy the city if there are 50 righteous people. And Abraham realizes that there's not 50 righteous. He said, what about 45? Lord, will you destroy the city if if there are 45 righteous? And the Lord says, no. What about 40, Abraham says. Lord, I don't want to trouble you. I don't want to make you mad at me. But what about 40? What if there's 40 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? Will you still destroy the city? And the Lord says, no, I won't destroy the city if there are 40 righteous people there. In fact, I won't destroy the city if there are 20. And Abraham says, well, what about 10? And the Lord said, no, I will not destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are ten righteous people. And so we know that God is God treats human beings fairly. God judges us fairly. And of course, there weren't even ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the whole, the, both of the cities were, were destroyed. But God, is, God treats us fairly. And not only does God treat us fairly, we know from Scripture that God is also patient. I know that to be true. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the, Peter writes that God uh, desires that everyone would be saved, and God is not willing that any should perish, but everyone come to repentance. And so we see that God is patient, and God, God, is, not, is, God is not a slacker, as some people count slackness. But God is patiently waiting. And so whatever happens to those who have never heard of Jesus uh, will be fair and just. And for many people, that's enough to know. And many people are okay or satisfied with simply knowing that God will be fair and just. But I need to take it for myself. I need to take it a little bit further. So I also know this, as I read the scripture, I'm also sure of this, that no one is, is innocent before the Lord. The scripture says that we've all sinned, Uh, whether we've heard of Jesus or not, all of us are sinners. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, for all have sinned, everyone has sinned, Uh, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. And if you read in Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, 
Paul makes the case that, that if you're a Jew, you're a sinner. If you're a Gentile or a pagan, you're a sinner. If you're a holy person, you're a sinner. And he concludes in, in chapter 3 and he says, For all of sin, every one of us has. So I know that for sure. There are no innocent people in this world. And I also know, and I also am sure of this, that apart from Jesus Christ, and apart from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and apart from Jesus' resurrection from the dead, there is no salvation for anyone. There's only one way to God's heaven, and that's God's way. And I, you may like it or may not like it, but that's what the Bible says. That's what I believe. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. John 14. So that's what I know for sure. And then someone may ask the question, well, what about the poor, innocent native of some lost tribe? How can they sin? How can they know God? And the biblical answer to that question is that God has revealed himself through his creation and through the world. We talked a little bit about that, I'm sure, in our Sunday school, in our Sunday school classes, in our Bible study groups, that God has placed within everyone on the face of the earth a sense of right and wrong. And it doesn't matter where you go in the world, everywhere that you go in the world, any civilization, any culture, anybody that you talk with, they would tell you that it's wrong to kill someone, an innocent person. There, there is no culture in the world that would say that it's okay to kill an innocent person. And so we know that God has, 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 has placed within us this sense of right and wrong. And he's also placed within us the realization that we often fail to do what is right. Not only do we know what is right from wrong, we also know that we do wrong at times, so no one can claim innocence before the Lord. And, and so, based on that, some would conclude, therefore, that God is just and fair in condemning any one of us to hell. And I would agree with that. If God were to, were to look upon us and he said, because you have failed and because you have fallen short, because you have missed the mark, I'm going to send you to hell, there's not one of us that could say, hey, but that's not fair. Because we all know right from wrong. And we all know that we should do right, and we all know that we do wrong, and so God would be, be, totally, would be totally right in doing that. Not that I have to judge what God does. But my hang-up is whether God grants everyone the opportunity to receive His grace and mercy. That's where I'm at. That's my hang-up. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that a holy and righteous God will not tolerate sin. The Bible makes it clear that sin has to be punished. And Christians are set free from the punishment of sin because they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not that God didn't mete out punishment for our sin. God surely did, but God did it on the back of Jesus Christ. He absorbed our punishment. His sacrificial death on the cross paid the price for us. Amen. That's right. Amen. But what about the heathen? They too are sinners. Will they be saved without Jesus? Or will they get off unpunished? See, that's the horning question. That's, that's, that's what I've been thinking about. That's what I struggle with. So that's what I know for sure. Then, then also let me share with you my biblical understanding. And you may agree with this or you may, you may disagree with this and that's okay. But this is how I, reading the scripture and praying about it. And these are some of the things that I'm working with. And, uh, and this is my biblical understanding. You see, in the group of those who have never heard of Jesus, I'm going to add the Old Testament personalities that believed and responded to God's revelation. You know, people like, like, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and King David, all of those individuals in the Old Testament, they never heard of Jesus. And I would make the argument that some of them really didn't have a good understanding of each, what eternal life was and, and living forever was all about. Uh, the Bible tells us in James that, that Abraham 
that Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Because Abraham believed God by faith. Now the Old Testament saints didn't really know how it was all going to work out. They didn't know how it was all going to be resolved. But they knew that God would work it out and they knew that God would resolve it. In Romans chapter 3, after Paul tells us that we have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, in, in Romans chapter 3, in verses 25 and 26, notice, what, notice what, what Paul has to say. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Got it. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his love, his life, Shedding his blood. Got it. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. You hear that? For he was looking ahead and including them and in what he would do in this present time. So what I get from that is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of them in the Old Testament, that God was withholding the punishment that they deserved because they sinned, because God was looking ahead to this present time, and he was going to include them. Once Christ was sacrificed on the cross for the sins, he was going to include them. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Having no understanding, these Old Testament personalities, having no understanding or at the, at the most a very limited understanding of God the Son, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament saints simply looked forward. They looked ahead to, to the one who would make all things right. They were looking ahead to the Messiah. And we know that salvation has always been through faith. You think of the parable of, uh, or the story that Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the publican in the synagogue. It's not a parable. The Pharisee and the publican in the synagogue. The Pharisee comes in and he, he has a bag full of pennies and coins and he drops them in the offering plate in the big thing that made a lot of noise and then so that everybody could hear what he brought. Remember that? And, and, and so he, he looks up, he sees the people standing around and they have his attention because they heard the coins drop and, and, he, and he prays to the Lord but he's really praying only to himself and he says, you know, oh, oh God, how great I am and I'm so glad that I'm a, uh, that I'm a Jew and I'm so glad that I'm not like that sinner over there. And that publican, that tax collector, that sinner, goes up to the offering plate and he drops in very quietly um, a few coins and he says, and he beats his breast and he says, Oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says that that man went away justified because of his faith in God. So this is it. This is, this is my, my biblical understanding of those who have never heard of Jesus. And it goes like this. Um, my biblical understanding is that they will be judged not according to how they responded to Jesus... Because they never heard of him, they couldn't respond to him. So they're not going to be judged how they would have responded to, to Jesus, but they're going to be judged on how they responded to God the Father, to the Father. Now upon hearing the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ, people can choose to accept Jesus or reject Jesus. And so what I'm saying is, if a person doesn't have that opportunity, uh, people can still choose to accept God the Father or to reject Him based on the knowledge that they have that comes from this general revelation that God provides through creation and through the things that we see 
all around us. So it's kind of a controversial understanding. I I, I know that, um, but I, I think if you if you don't know who Jesus is, how can you accept him? Now we were talking a little bit this morning. We we looked at some some examples about Cornelius. Uh, we looked at the uh, Ethiopian eunuch and how those those individuals didn't know Jesus, but they really had a desire to know God and have a relationship with God. And God uh, miraculously, supernaturally sends Philip to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch, sends Peter to go to Cornelius. And so for those that are really wanting and desiring to know who God is, God provides a way. And... That's what our writer of the commentary said this morning. Uh, so, so that's out there as well. That if you really want to know God, that God is loving and God will reveal himself to us. So with that understanding that someone will ask, well then so I can just sit on my hands. After all, if they're going to be taken care of anyway, why bother? But the answer to that question is absolutely not. We can't sit on our hands. We are God's means. We have been commanded by God in the scriptures to make disciples from all nations and from all peoples. And we are to teach them about repentance. We are to teach them about faith in Jesus. We are to help them to grow in the grace and knowledge of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible reveals that we are laborers together with God to to bring about God's desire and God's purpose. And we may not know ultimately how God will deal with the heathen, but it is still our responsibility to bring them the word of Jesus Christ. And in spite of the fact that the heathen may receive salvation through Jesus, if they respond to God the Father through the revelation that he provides, it is far more difficult for them to do it without a clear gospel presentation. So it may be possible for those that have never heard about Jesus to become saved, but it's going to be very difficult. And furthermore, I am convinced that we will have to give an answer for our failures of, of sharing the gospel with those who need to hear it. it will, but it will not stop God from accomplishing His purpose and desires. So we'll have to face... Uh, or have to give an answer for the fact that God every year sends us all these children, all these families and through vacation Bible school and we don't follow up as we should with the gospel and make those connections with these children and their families. And I was, as I uh, heard um, Saturday morning, it probably takes at least two years when you make a connection with a, with a family that is unchurched, it takes at least two years before you would ever see them in your congregation. So that's what I know for sure. That's my biblical understanding. Now let me share with you what we need to be concerned about this morning. When we die, there are two options for where we're going to spend eternity. And these two options are for everyone, whether you have heard about Jesus or haven't heard about him. Whether you've accepted Jesus or haven't accepted Jesus, there are two places. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 it says that it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment. And whether you believe the Bible or not, statistics bear this out. At some point in their lives, one out of one people die. Uh, those people that are involved in insurance and all of that have these mortality rates. And, you know, what, what's the mortality rate, the percentage of people who die in this? The mortality rate in the United States is 100%. But what happens next? What happens after that? What happens after we die? And what happens after we die depends on what happens before you die. I want to share a passage of scripture with you from Matthew chapter 25. That's, this is our text for this morning, and don't worry, we'll be out in time for the Super Bowl to start. Matthew chapter 25, beginning verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom uh, prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And did I share with you that we're receiving an offering for the Good Samaritan house following the service this morning? Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in a prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for, the one of, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So Jesus says the day will come, the king will come, and he will gather everyone unto himself. And as everyone is standing before him, he will divide the whole human race into two, into two very broad categories. There will be those on his right hand and those on his left hand. And those on the right hand will be called the saved because they have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And those that are on the left will be referred to as the lost because they have refused to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then Jesus says those that are saved, when they die, they will go directly into the presence of the Lord. And he goes on to say, for the lost, that death begins an experience of unending consciousness and unending punishment in hell. Hell, there's, you know, there's, there's, um, there's trouble. There's trouble with hell. Hell presents a side of God that, that oftentimes people say, well, you know, it's unpleasant and it's unfair. Well, half of that is true. It's, it's really unpleasant to talk about the nature of God and to talk about hell at the same time. But it's truly not unfair. Because hell is the punishment of those who have refused to accept God's right to rule in their lives. And it's no more than what those who have rebelled against God all of their life desire. Uh, those that, are go, that, that go to hell are those people that have, des, have lived their lives and desired all of, for their whole life that they don't want anything to do with God. So he is sending them exactly to where they want to be. In a place where God is absent. And in a place that exists for all eternity. So when a person desires to live a life with no place with God then they will spend an eternity in a place without God. And because God is the source of everything good, James tells us that, the Psalms tells us that, then existence from Him can only be very bad and very unpleasant. Because where God is, there's where good is. Some believers question the justice of hell. They doubt its existence. Uh, they don't really think it's fair. They don't really think it's there. But I want you to notice in these verses what Jesus said about hell. Uh, Jesus says hell is real. It's a real place. Jesus says that hell is separation from God. The essence of hell is relational. Hell is separation, separation or it's banishment from the most beautiful place in the world where the presence of God is. Notice what Jesus here says about hell, that hell is for the cursed. Verse 41, depart from me, you who are cursed. 
Notice that he says that hell is eternal. Go to the eternal place. Just as heaven is eternal, so hell is eternal. Some people think that hell is an, an annihilation. You know, you, Jesus, Jesus condemns you to hell and there you're burnt up in the fire and that's it. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Hell is a real separation from a loving God for all of eternity. Notice what else Jesus says about hell, that it's a fire. It's the, it, it's the judgment of God. And so my concern this morning, right now in these moments, is not really what will happen to those who have never heard of Jesus after they die. That's not my real concern this morning. My real concern this morning is what is going to happen to you after you die. What's going to happen to you after you die? Will you heed the warning? Will you heed the warning that Jesus, uh, that, that, that Jesus tells us about? You see, hell is an option for all, for any of us. It's the other option and, and it's the option that can be avoided. Will you heed the warning? Will you come this morning? Will you receive Jesus Christ? As your Lord and Savior. And, and I'm really concerned about that because I know that there are. I know that the Lord is working with some folks this morning. And I know that some folks need to make this decision. And when you put the decision off, you're saying no. Only when you say yes, do you say yes. Deep in my heart, there's a gladness. Jesus has saved me from sin. Praise to his name, what a savior. He cleanses without and within. My real concern this morning is what is going to happen to you after you die. Let's stand together. Let's sing our hymn of invitation this morning. Why do I sing about Jesus? And if there's a decision that you need to make this morning, you come, you make that decision. Don't put it off. Maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you're, but you want to let us know that you've made that decision. Will you come and will you make that decision as we sing together this morning?